Hey guys, it is December 17th, 2017, and this is your episode 125 of At Percussion. I'm your host, Casey Cangelosi, and with me as usual are Laurel Black. Hi. And Ben Charles. Hi, everybody. Megan Arns is out today. I think she's doing a Christmas gig for her school, something mm -hmm. like that. So, hey, Megan, we miss you out there. And I think I'll just dive right in and talk about our guest. You guys, our guest today serves as assistant professor of percussion at the University of Baylor School of Music in Waco, Texas. He has commissioned works from Paul Lansky, David Lang, Charles Warren, and, and Alejandro Vignal, just to name a couple. He is part of the Meehan Perkins duo along with Doug Perkins. He's also the founder of Liquid Drum. And in my opinion, he has single-handedly made being on social media fun again, at least for me. I think that's fair to say. So how's it going, Todd Meehan? Uh, it's great. Thank you guys so much for having me. Thank you for that lovely introduction. And um, yeah, really pleased to, to be here and to chat with you guys. Yeah, yeah, you're very welcome. So we have some Facebook questions from Todd, and actually we got a lot of Facebook comments, people saying things like, oh, this is going to be the funniest episode ever, and it's just going to be nothing but Casey and Todd joking. Todd, what uh, do you see any reason behind this? Is there any reasoning <laughs> for these these... <laughs> Like people not taking this podcast with the utmost professionalism and seriousness. Right. Um, you know, I think the, the interesting thing about that is that, um, I, I mean, absolutely believe 100%. Like I'm not, I am not that funny. Um, <laughs> I've found like for, for whatever reason, um, I mean, so all of the, the liquid drum stuff that has happened, um, is, you know, I just sort of accidentally stumbled into a lot of it and kind of found a venue and a vehicle for, um, you know, in some cases satirizing and, and poking fun at the stuff that we do. And, um, I have found that at least in some ways, I think it kind of works using that, you know, the, the, the vehicle, um, and, well, social media and, and video specifically. Um, so it's been interesting because I've never, I, like I, you know, I didn't set out to, to do any of that. And like when I view other things happening on social media, like when I view um, any of your stuff, Casey, that, that is intended to be funny, um, I think it's, I think it's absolutely hilarious. But when I reflect back on some of the things um, that I do, I don't, you know, like maybe a soft chuckle, but I, but I, I'm really, I'm not, I don't perceive myself as being someone who's, who's funny. And I think people who, who know me would say, like, I think Doug, um, probably says that all the time. Like Todd is actually not that funny. Like, I, you know, I don't, I don't see what the, what the, what, what, what all the hubbub is about. So, um, yeah, I mean, no, I don't think, I don't think it's just going to be a joke fest or if it is, it's going to f fall flat because I'm, I won't have much to offer. Ben's pretty <laughs> funny though. That's good. Well, I'm already kind of sick of this discussion. I was wondering if we could just talk about who has the fastest hands on Facebook. <laughs> I, so, so, so real quick, I can't believe how many people I've had to tell that the Michael Burrett video was sped up. Right. Yeah, <laughs> like, like several I know. people. Several people are like that's fake, right? It's like guys, he's totally joking around. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I. But I, I mean, that's like it, that was so amazing though. Like it's it's so beautiful how, you know, I don't know, just like the the we all just sort of got swept up in that thing, and and then and you you know, I guess some people don't, you know, maybe if they don't know about, you know, like how videos work or how fast, you know, hands can, you know, go or what's, what's humanly possible. They may, maybe they think like, I don't know, man, it's Mike Burrett. So 195 yeah. seems, seems totally reasonable. Um, <laughs> but I remember when he did that at some point I was on a text thread with Doug and Josh and, um, and, but even Doug was like, he was like, that was fake, right? <laughs> like, yeah, it's totally, <laughs> totally, totally <laughs> fake. <laughs> I mean, it's, Yeah. Definitely not real. <laughs> well, he did do a great job. Like he moved, he he moved his head slowly so right. that when it was sped up, it would look realistic. And yeah. I mean, they they definitely, you know, you could tell his students 
really trying to be still. It's like, oh man, this is just this is just great because they're totally like, how fun is that? You know? Right, right. I thought it was amazing. I, I was also one of the people that asked Casey. I was like, that's great, right? <laughs> <laughs> I could tell Casey was trying to be polite and not call me out, but I was one of those people. <laughs> well, I, I think if there's one lesson to share with our students and aspiring, you know, content creators, it is that play is very valuable. We, we were talking to someone, I think on the podcast. Oh, you know what? I think it was Marco and... Um, talking about how i think it was marco and not important but how video games when we were kids i mean that really taught me about computers right and goofing around on software like finale as a kid really taught you how to how to actually use it so you know this podcast is something i'm I'm doing mostly for fun and my own enrichment but I'm learning a whole lot about video editing and even something like as silly as the fast hands challenge and those couple of responses I made, you know, we were, we were in our final faculty meeting just a few days ago and our horn professor, Ian Zook, he came up to me after and we just chatted, how's it going? And, and he said, I've been following this whole thing, this, this hands thing. And I, I don't get it at all, but I love it. I don't. And I'm so impressed with how y'all are able to edit these videos. And it's so funny. And it just seems like, wow, you guys, you guys have your own thing. Yeah. I don't know. It's just, it's, it is, it is really special. I think. Yeah. And I, I absolutely agree too, because I, like, I am very much, especially at the start start of all of this, um, like I'm, I I was not tech savvy, um, and still am am very much not all that savvy with all of this stuff. Um, but I, but I've treated it in exactly the same way that you just described, which is every single time I do a video or put something together. I feel like, I mean, I'm, I'm absolutely educating myself and learning something and trying to get better and, and, you know, finding like, Oh, I'm faster at this. And, you know, make a choice of like, okay, if this is just a quick and easy thing, I'm just going to do it on iMovie. But if it's something that needs a little bit more, I'll, you know, I'm trying to learn Adobe Premiere Pro and, and, you know, so like it's all of that is like, it, it, it becomes, or part of, part of it becomes just a way to keep learning. And, um, and it's amazing, like how, you know, how you can find something like that and do it. And I, I think it's, you know, that's no different from a new piece that we're playing or, you know, a new instrument that we come to. Um, but yeah, I, it's, Every, every single time. And I think everybody I know who is doing it, like we've had this dis- discussion with Josh Quillen before that he's like, <laughs> you know, he's even less savvy on the video side of things. Um, I think what he does is hilarious, but you know, he admitted after the fast hands things, he's like, that thing took me all day to, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to like put that together, <laughs> you know? And I've wondered before where I've kind of had this, you know, the, the conversation with myself of like, you know, am I, am I, am I wasting my time? Like, should I, my hands would actually be a lot faster if I were practicing (laughs) during the the process of like trying to do all this video editing. Um, and I think I've come to a a place that I'm comfortable with of like, no, this is another skill set. This is part of my creative output. Um, and it's just a period in my life where I want to do, you know, more of this and, um, so yeah, you know, you know, I don't feel bad about like sometimes video editing takes hours and, and that's okay. It's like practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you got there, Ben? So what I'm sitting here thinking is like science fiction has like made a lot of real things like happen. Like people looked at Star Trek years ago and saw these fancy communicators. Then we had cell phones. So I bet there's some middle school kid that's going to see the video of Mike Burrett and then think that everyone can move their hands at 195 and aspire to do that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think I don't. Yeah. I think you're, I think you're right. Or yeah, get closer and closer to it. You know, like I did, I mean the one, what I think was, um, legit video, um, well, no, it was, it was legit. You know, the fastest one I saw was 150. Casey yours was 144, I believe. Um, but I saw one that was a little bit faster and I'm like, you know, I, whether it's 144 or 150, both of those are, are out of my, my reach, but like, you know, they're not, they're not that far off from 195. Like sure. you, you could probably push yourself to 160. I like, I don't know. Um, so 
No, I think, I think Ben, that's, that's, that's true. And that's like with all the stuff that's happening, even just performance videos or like the, the stuff that Evan Chapman is putting out, like everything raises the bar because it's like, man, look at this now. This is, you know, look how amazing this is. We all have to get better at it. So, well, on this raising the bar concept and forgive me, Laurel and Ben, cause you've heard me say this on the podcast, my dad ran track. Yeah, high jump, long jump, uh, sprint. He did track in, in college, I believe. And he said he got to live through the the record mile run and how right. it got faster and faster and faster. And I forget how this goes exactly, but it started, you know, six minutes. Oh, yeah, that's the fastest mile ever. And then as soon as somebody broke it, literally the next day, many people broke it. Right, and right. that process continued all the way down to it's something like a four minute mile now. Right. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So once it's just done once, and everyone can see, hey, this is possible. You know, like Todd said, yeah, some some high school kid's gonna break it tomorrow. You know. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think it's very healthy for a community to like push itself and its members in a way that, like you said earlier, is connected to play rather than merely competition or judgment or comparison, you know? Right. Yeah. If everybody's having a good time, it's much more enjoyable. It's just enjoyable to watch and to be a part of. Well, I think the competition turned into, okay, we don't care. We don't actually care who can play faster, who can, who can be funnier. (laughs) Yeah. 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 (laughs) But you know, like I, I was talking to one of my grad students, um, after that weekend and he was like, Oh, that was so fun to see. And like, one of the things for me that I thought was, you know, first of all, I I had no idea if anybody was actually going to participate in this thing. Like, you know, you start some of these things and they totally fall flat and it's fine. You move on. Um, but you know, after it began to take shape, like you could really see people's personalities and like their, you know, their, their creativity really kind of coming to the fore. Um, and I think you could even see that in, in Mike's version because Mike's like, you know, he's, he, 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 like, I lovingly describe him sometimes as like kind of, you know, he's kind of like a jock, like he's, you know, and I mean that in the best possible way, like he's got these just crazy hands and, and this crazy energy. So of course his video is going to be him, you know, doing this thing at some insane tempo. Um, and but like everyone who offered something had some version of that, like, you know, your multiple videos, Casey, um, you know, became like a, like a, like a mini drama, you know, which which was, which was amazing, you know? So like, that was the beautiful thing for me. Of course, like you said, like, who cares? People's hands move however fast they move. Um, and it wasn't really a fast hands challenge to begin with. Um, so we just kind of had an excuse to come together and, and laugh and kind of have fun with music. Very cool. Steve Schick said he's actually working on his video still, but he'll be submitting it soon. (laughs) (laughs) I look forward to that. Break from practicing Zanakis. Right. right. It's coming. It'll come a month later. Yeah. A month too late. Like, what is, what is this? (laughs) Hey, Laura, how about a Facebook question for Todd? Yeah, this comes from Brian Bloom, a friend of the podcast. He says, why Liquid Drum? The name as well as the purpose behind starting and continuing it. He's curious how it's affected your work uh, as a player and a teacher. And thanks for all the laughs. Cool. Um, Yeah, uh, the name, the name and kind of the whole idea. um, I don't know. I mean, it, it. it wasn't super well formulated at the beginning. Um, the name itself came to me in the same way that I think any of my, uh, video ideas or, or whatever social media content I put up come to me. And that's usually just when I'm doing something else, something non-musical, um, just, you know, ideas hit me or, or word combinations hit me or, you know, things that I just kind of ponder for a while. Um, with all of this, it's, it's been very rare that I've ever, ever sat down and thought like, okay, you know, I've got this idea for this thing and I need a name for it. So let me write down, you know, 20 names and I'm going to pick the best one. And, and now I need to like build this video library. So let me write, you know, 
usually it's like sweeping the floor or doing yard work. And I think like, Oh, Hey, wouldn't it be funny? Or like, isn't this silly the way we do this thing or that thing? Um, and then I just kind of run with it in my head and I usually, you know, kind of chew on an idea for a day or two. And if I think it's still good by the end of that, I'll, I'll kind of jot it down and, and try to flesh it out a little bit more. Um, so yeah, both the name and the initial, whatever the initial version of, of, of this thing was, um, they, they kind of came about in that way, which is somewhat unintentional. Um, <clears throat> but then once I saw it, uh, I, th I did kind of think more critically about it and, um, I thought, okay, this can be kind of an umbrella idea for anything and everything I want to do, at least individually going forward in my career. And, um, so I had, you know, I, I already had this idea of writing a percussion accessories method book. And I thought, you know, rather than try to, you know, pitch this to one of the music publishers, I do want to self publish, but if I self publish, um, I don't know, like maybe it would be smart to put it out under some, you know, other broader concept or name or idea or something. So, um, and all of this kind of collided with a, a semester sabbatical that I took from Baylor. And so what that did is it gave me uh, time to, to like really think and, and to take a breath, which is, you know, hard to do uh, most of the time. Um, and then the, and then the, the videos just kind of unfolded naturally from there, just as we were saying before, um, Casey with, with just like trying stuff, I got a, I got a nice camera and I got some, you know, I just got some gear that I was going to use to record videos for the tambourine and triangle book. And I started just having fun in my office cause I had free time. I didn't, you know, I wasn't teaching. Um, and then it, you know, it, kind of followed a direction of, well, whatever the initial videos were for a while. And then I had to, the interesting thing is that I never wanted it to be, I think I said this up front, I never wanted it to be, um, it wasn't supposed to be like comedy based or anything, you know, that was never how I conceived of it. Um, so I kind of had to work to, to, to change to somewhat change direction later on. So after I had done some of these things, um, knowing that that's, it was going to be kind of pegged that way. Um, when I was putting the book out, like I would even have people ask me, like, is the book serious? Like, is mm -hmm. the book oh, just wow. like, <laughs> like just a bunch of jokes or something, you know, like, is the whole thing a joke? Um, hmm. which, you know, that would have been genius if it was like, if I was still writing this thing and none of it was actually real. Um, but it's, but it, no, it is real. And like, I do want to mix in like, you know, solid pedagogy and good information and just, you know, kind of have this, this company that, that toys with and talks about those aspects in addition to like general percussion lifestyle stuff. Um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of how it developed. Um, how does it impact my, like my professional endeavors, um, teaching or whatever. I mean, it's, there's a lot of ways to answer that. Um, I think it's been, I think it's been really good overall. I do think, you know, it does take away, I think I'm entering into a new phase of life now at the age of 40 where, um, you know, I've definitely scaled back some of my performing, um, not because I'd want to give that up, but just because like my kids are at an age where I want to be around as much as possible. Uh, I've gone through the tenure process. So I don't have to worry about like, you know, go, 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 go all the time, um, in order to rack up performances and things like that. Um, so, um, it, you know, it's sort of filling that, somewhat of a void, um, rather than having like, okay, I've got this concert program that I have to learn this month. And then, you know, my duo is going to do this thing in another two months. And then I, you know, um, I just have time to do some of these other elements and aspects of, of my professional life. So, um, yeah, it's been, it's been, I think really great and everything has, has just been kind of fed into it and it's been good, I think for my students and, um, and it's been good for recruiting. Um, and we'll just kind of see where it goes from, from this point on. Yeah, sure. Th this recent 
thing we did together, this panel discussion that hmm? Rob and Adam Tan put together, R- Rob Knopper and Adam Tan put together, they, um, <laughs> and also, I don't know if you followed my, I got my wrist slapped on one of our group Facebook pages because I was complaining about methods of advertising by right. one of our yeah. friends. <laughs> <laughs> I remember and, you. I remember you doing that. I don't. Rem- did you get your wrist slapped like publicly or? or? I mean, just just on the no, nothing serious. And this actually, it's, it was all. It all turned out incredibly loving and kind and and really good. I mean, especially with the with the person I got in the you know in the actual argument with like that actually right. between he and I that like ended the most the most peaceful. But I was just kind of talking about. When is it appropriate to advertise on these group discussion pages? And it's bothering me that, no, these are about discussion and they should be about serious questions. But anyway, it's um, I, I, I kind of came to f- realize, like, okay, maybe I'm wrong about that and not everyone sees eye to eye. And, okay, that's fine. This group, they just don't see it that way. But anyway, that's that's it's not that important. But what it did make me think is between that experience the discussion panel we did at PASIC and even this recent Fast Hands Challenge thing, it's made me realize like advertising is not the same thing as branding. Right. So yeah, yeah even when you're, you're spending time making a, a funny thing to connect with your audience or something and you're enjoying it. Yeah. You're maybe not directly advertising, but you might be branding yourself for a time when you're then right. going to actually advertise or, or something. Right. I'm sure I'm wording that completely wrong and megan's dad who who actually does study business <laughs> would, would tell me how that <laughs> that i'm right but you have to say it this other way i'm sure but uh, right. i don't know this is, I, I feel like i learned a cool lesson through that little chain of experiences yeah no i think you i think you said it really well and i think you're exactly right um you know with with all of this like you know for me it, it is all one big experiment like i the world I inhabited prior to doing any of this, um, I understood, like I understood what it meant to have my teaching job. And I understood what it meant to then to go out and do concerts and commission things and record every now and again, um, like that, that all made sense because I had done it, had, had been doing it from the moment, you know, I was in grad school and moving into the early part of my career. Um, the stuff I'm doing now, like I didn't understand any of it. Um, so like I am just, you know, I'm trying to digest, you know, I'm listening to podcasts all the time about entrepreneurship and all of this. And, you know, we talk about all that stuff a lot and that, that has infiltrated the, the, you know, music school world plenty, but, but really understanding what it means with like, you know, with, with a business, um, as opposed to just me as a performing artist or me as part of, you know, the duo with Doug, um, it's, it's different. And so like those topics come up all the time. Um, you know, like, are you, should you try to cultivate your personal brand and how does that feed into whatever you're doing professionally? Um, or should you just, you know, have everything, you know, mixed together? Um, I remember early on listening to, uh, an interview with, uh, one of the founders of, um, Chubbies. They make like those, like really like they're like short shorts. I think that like okay. guys wear, they're like cut off jean shorts or something. I think, um, like, I don't know exactly what it is, but it's a clothing it's a clothing line. Um, and it was, it was, it was found or started by, um, just like some guys in college, I think, um, who were just having a good time. And they were talking about kind of the beauty of their marketing was that they weren't, they weren't necessarily selling something. They were just making these, you know, these interesting and funny commercials that were sort of, you know, holding up a, a mirror or a window to, to, to this lifestyle, whatever this, you know, what they've defined as this chubby's lifestyle. So that could be like guys just like swimming in a pool or, you know, having beers somewhere. I don't know something. Um, but like in doing that, they, they obviously attracted a lot of people to their brand. That's like, Hey, this is really fun. Like, what is this? This is funny. Um, 
And then, you know, maybe the next time they, they're looking to buy a pair of shorts, they're like, oh, right, Chubbies, they make shorts and they're funny. You know, like I had this thought yesterday driving around when I heard another Geico commercial. Now, Geico is like, they're directly marketing, but, you know, their marketing is 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 savvy and it's funny and it's um, like, it's enormously contrasting. You know, like, I think they're one of the few companies that have like completely separate, like, you know, worlds of marketing of like, we're going to do this thing with the gecko and then we're going to do this thing with the, you know, like, um, and I don't even know what the thing was. It was a radio spot. And I just kind of chuckled at it. Like, Oh, that's funny. You know? And they weren't, you know, at the end there was something about like, you know, call Geico and, and get your car insurance. Um, but it was like an afterthought. And so they're working on the brand. I think, you know, back to what you said, they're totally branding and, yeah, I mean they're gonna, they do sell car car insurance. That is, you know, kind of the end game. But you know, in the meantime, they can entertain people. And even if those people never like jump on board, you know, over the course of a five, ten, or fifteen year period, I don't know. Maybe maybe one day they will. Um, and my mother in law was an insurance person. It's the only reason I'm not going with Geico right now is we we have our insurance. But you know, like I I kind of thought that to myself of like, man, Geico, they're I don't know. They're kind of cool. Like, I don't know even, I don't even know what the product is, but like, I just, I respect what they're doing. So maybe I would check it out if I was in the market for that. Well, and the amazing thing is if you're right, they sell car insurance, but if they were to stop selling car insurance and sell something else, they would sustain all the, those years of comedic branding right. that they've built up. Right. You right. know what I mean? Like people are going to remember them for something else. Yeah. Yeah. You totally. Know? Yeah, yeah. Let's see. So let's yeah. take a question. You have a question there, Laurel? I do, but first, random tidbit. I think the my uncle works at the advertising firm that came up with the gecko for the Geico. Oh, nice. Is that right? Company. Yeah. <laughs> He's done a lot of things like that. Um, well, please pass along my congratulations. I, <laughs> oh, I will. <laughs> I think what they, yeah, no, I mean, I think they're, what they do is amazing. Yeah, he's super clever. Um uh, yeah, I have a question. So I know we've talked a lot about videos and things and, um, but that's just one part of your liquid drum project. And I was looking at a lot of your blogs cause I'm a pretty avid reader and, um, I, I really liked one of them where you talked about learning an instrument, not just a piece. Right. And, and in the realm of teaching, I feel like that's something we have to, like, you have to remember to say a lot of the time because we get so focused on making sure a student can execute these things that it can be easy to lose the big picture. And I'm guessing that that concept has been in your teaching for some time. And I'm curious if it was something you got from one of your teachers or did you just uh, come up with it and decide to share it on your blog and I yeah. have a follow up question to it as well. Yeah. Um, it was, I mean, really the idea was, um, first, uh, I mean, I say introduced to me, but basically just first sort of revealed to me, um, um, in grad school when I was studying with Bob Van Sice and he, he was always a big advocate of, of that idea, which is very interesting because he's also very much a like repertoire based teacher. Like he has, mm -hmm. there are very specific pieces that you would study with him you know, that he knows really well. And that's kind of how he does his teaching through those pieces. Um, but so I think that's why it struck me, um, the way it did, because, you know, I, I grew to know that about him, but then when he said that, I was like, Oh, Right. You're like, you're just, you're just using, you know, this piece as, as a way to get me or anyone else to understand this big, beautiful instrument a little bit better. Um, and it's, I mean, yeah, the piece is amazing and it, and it deserves our time and attention, but it's at the end of the day, it's not totally about the piece. If it were just about that piece, we wouldn't have much. Um, you know, it's about being able to play anything on this thing. So, um, that's when it first hit me. And then, um, I think it was really solidified by, by, you know, I'm from Texas originally. So, um, 
having been away and then coming back when I started teaching at Baylor, um, the, there's a lot of amazing things that happen in the Texas, um, you know, public schools in terms of music education. But one of the things I think sometimes that is not so great about it is that we, they, it is very much like, um, piece oriented, like the all state process or solo and ensemble or whatever. And, and that may be true of any state, but like for sure, Texas, it's kind of a machine in that way. So, um, you know, in recruiting students or working with high school students, I'd see that all the time. And then I would, I would then further reflect on my own upbringing and high school years in Texas and think, I was totally, that, that was me. I did the same exact thing. Like I, you know, worked on this Cerrone snare piece for like three or four months. And it wasn't, I, there was never a thought in my head that this was about learning the snare drum. It was about learning Cerrone number, whatever. Um, so, and part of that's just like, I know for myself, I wasn't old enough to, to, to recognize that, to understand what it was I was really doing or, or should have been doing. Um, so yeah, I try, I try to instill that and I try to reflect on that and I try to bring that, um, to the attention of my students. And I, you know, sometimes I think I do an okay job of it. And sometimes I get lost in the weeds as well. And it's like, you know, we're super deep into doing, you know, like studying this marimba piece or this multi-piece. And like the only thing I ever offer, you know, information about the piece itself. And I have to kind of, you know, pour the cold water over my head and say, wait a second, you know, like, what are we, what are we doing here? Um, so yeah, I really, I believe in it. I think it's, I think it's tough to convey sometimes. And I think, I think, you know, like anything else in a musician's upbringing, I think it, you know, that's going to hit people at different times in their life. And it's only going to be meaningful when it, you're like at the right age and a right maturity level to understand it. Um, and for me, that was a little bit older, you know, before I could really gather what that, what that meant. Yeah, mm. sure. Sure. It made me think of, um, you know, a student who asked me earlier in the semester, he wants to play this particular piece, the Bach Toccata and Fugue. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, well, you just, you successfully performed marimba flamenca. So right. it's like, like <laughs> I don't want to stifle any of your energy, right. but we got some, some steps, to go through. <laughs> you know, but that, but this is a great way to talk about it of like, you don't, you perhaps don't understand the instrument well enough to do something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, totally. I thought you were going to different say than saying you're not ready. You right. can't. It's just, um, yeah. My, my quick follow up question was, uh, from your secondary post about learning the instrument where you mentioned a book called make it stick the science of successful learning. Uh -huh. And I'd never heard of this book, but it sounds really quite Interesting. So I'm wondering if you could just talk about how you heard of it, your favorite concepts from it. Yeah. Um, it was introduced to me in, I did like a, a summer faculty Institute about, uh, it's probably five years ago now. And, um, we had some, um, like, uh, every afternoon we'd have some sort of professional development. So somebody from some discipline would come in and talk about, you know, their research or what they were doing. So, um, we had, um, people who were into like cognitive, cognitive psychology come in, you know, from our, from our sciences. And, uh, this is one of the things that they talked about. And I just found it fascinating because they, they were talking about it, of course, in terms, they were talking to a room full of, of, um, professors who were not music specific. They were, you know, from all corners of the university. So they were talking about it in terms of how students study and how students learn, of course, and, you know, trying to, to, um, kind of increase student learning and, and how we should approach things and what, you know, so, but for me, I was drawing all of it into like, Oh, you know, how we practice and how we learn pieces and, and how we transfer that into performance. And so I chatted with one of the guys, uh, afterwards and just told him that like, well, you know, how do you think this all relates to, to the study of music? And he was like, it's all, it's all the same. Um, and he listed a couple of examples from the book, which got me really interested. The one which really stuck out to me, um, was this example of, I think there's two, maybe there's one with where they did kind of two test groups, um, shooting baskets, um, like one test group, 
Um, oh yeah, uh, we've talked about this. Yeah, it, it's something about like you about know, the, the the buckets and how far yeah, away they are. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So mm-hmm. the one test group is like they're only shooting from the one that will eventually be tested and they do it over and over. And the other test group is they never do that one. They do like, you know, closer, farther away, whatever. And then they're tested on that one specific one. And it's the people that have been doing, you know, closer and farther away Mm -hmm. um, that end up doing better. And that like totally blew my mind because as I, as I related that to whether my own practice or my own teaching, just in terms of like note accuracy, I was like, you know, like I am always, always, you know, either screaming at myself or, you know, telling students like, you know, I mean, we've, we've all heard it before, like perfect practice makes perfect performance. Um, and it kind of gave me this fresh view on like, you know, all of those reps of Porgy where I, where I missed, you know, that note or this note or, or a lot of notes, like, those are still valid. Those are still helpful, you know? And sometimes we like, don't let ourselves out of the practice room until like, man, you have to do it, you know, 10 times or 20 times to 20 times perfectly. And the reality is, and and, you know, it's all good because when you do that, you end up doing it like 50 times and, and 30 of them are probably not perfect. And maybe if you're lucky 20 are, but it's, it's, it's the, you know, it's the whole body of work that's actually helping you to get better. And at least in my mind, I was always discarding the 30 versions I did where I, you know, drop this note or clip this thing or whatever. And I thought, well, the only thing that was meaningful here was those 20 where I got it perfectly right. Um, so I think it was just kind of liberating to me, like, you know, cause I just didn't, I don't know. And, and, and it, I'm sure if there's a, if, if you have a cognitive uh, psychologist or, or scientist listening to your podcast, I'm not sure your, what your audience is, but they may be like rolling their eyes at my description of this. Um, so I don't know the specifics of, you know, exactly how it all lines up, but I do think like a lot of those theories um, that are laid out in there really, really helped me just to kind of have a fresh Uh, perspective on music learning and then in turn, you know, how I handle that with, with my teaching of students. Yeah, sure. I've, I've never been a big subscriber to, if you're practicing wrong notes, you're not practicing perfectly. And, uh, you know, I, I think of instances like, um, you know, the low B natural in Mishi, that's a big Mm -hmm. reach and it's so hard to hit every time and you have to hit it over and over and over. And the way I ironed that out when I was a kid is, okay, I keep missing it. Sometimes I hit C natural, which sounds awful. Sometimes I hit a, which doesn't sound good, but sounds a little better because it's (laughs) a key. I would practice hitting the wrong notes. I would say, okay, what does it, Mm -hmm. what does it feel like to hit C natural? Okay, what does it feel right. like to hit A? And by doing that, you would really learn where the B is. Right, right. So anyway, Ben, you, you, you've had something for a while. Yeah, so I hope Todd doesn't mind me bringing this up, but he, we started to mention, like, big life things and all. And uh, I guess it was maybe around the beginning of the semester, Todd shared a video on Facebook that it was one of those that kind of went around quite a bit about a, a health scare you had, and I, I, you addressed it on the video, so I'm assuming you're okay with talking about it. But right. if Farnick could uh, tell us a little more about that and what it made you value in life, and now that you're a few months out from it, what your, you know, how your thoughts have changed about it? Yeah. Um, yeah, it was totally, totally crazy and unexpected. Um, so I mean, the, the, the gist, the main gist of it is that in May I was diagnosed with colon cancer. Um, by the end of May, I had been through surgery, um, had part of my colon removed, um, and the tumor removed and been like, I totally cleared. And, you know, I, I, it was like a three week span <laughs> where I was like diagnosed with cancer you know, and all the stuff that comes with that and kind of sitting on that with, you know, my family for, for a couple of weeks. And then like literally just a couple of weeks after that, like, okay. And now, now I'm, you know, like I'm just resting for the summer. Like I had surgery, so I have to come back from that. But, um, yeah, it it was really, really wild. So for probably five years prior to that, um, I had been dropping weight, um, just, and not like not trying to drop weight. 
and always I would like chalk it up to, to stress and, and maybe, you know, drinking too much coffee or whatever. I don't know. Um, but we kind of kept tracking it and tracing it. And I just kept dropping more and more weight, even though I was like, you know, consuming tons of food, like trying to keep weight on. Um, and we, we just kind of went through a lot of different tests there at the very end, which revealed this, this tumor. Um, so there's no family history of that or direct family history, at least. Um, I'm super young for that, you know, like you're not even, um, you know, not to get too detailed, but you're, you know, really you're not going to get a colonoscopy usually until you're 50, but you know, I had just turned 40. Um, so like totally off of our radar, like we're just blown away when we, when we heard about it. Um, but yeah, luckily caught it early and, um, it, it, like none of the surrounding lymph nodes were, were infected and it didn't spread. And so like everything totally great. And so I you know, took the summer to basically heal and rest. Um, and just like my department was really, um, cool about everything and gave me whatever time I needed, but I was able to come back right at the beginning of the fall semester. And like, it's been like everything, everything is good to go. So cool. totally wild. Um, I don't know what it all means, <laughs> but, uh, other than like, I, now I just, you know, I have to, yeah, I have to get tested every, every year. Like I'll have colonoscopies every year. Um, and then for my boys, like they, like if you have a parent who is diagnosed, I think they have to start their testing maybe 10 years prior to my, um, you know, the age when, when I was diagnosed. So they'll start at the age of 30, but we did genetic testing and everything. And like, there's no, I don't have the gene. So like, they, it's just, it's just one of those things. It's just one of those crazy, crazy things, but like, you know, absolutely positively, like I, I'm, I'm so indebted to uh, my wife because she was the one that was like, you know, you're, you're withering away. Like, what is, what is like, you have to go, like, I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't have gone back to the doctor. Cause it was just like, Oh, I'm thin. You know, I don't know. Like maybe I'm just in a thin phase or something, but she was like, no, this isn't right. You know, you have to go. And with those things, of course, if I would have waited another three or four years, like then it could have been really, really bad. So yeah, that was kind of nuts, but that's wow. what my, that's well, what my son was. Thanks so much for sharing because it's it, it's important we we normalize this you know because right. cool. men are uh, historically <laughs> inconsistently do like you said like oh I won't go to the doctor I won't right. go it's probably or we're just like so hesitant to do it so it's yeah it's very kind of you to 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 make the video you made and even now to share it again yeah absolutely for me for me it's it it actually cuts very close to home because my father when he was 38 or 39, like basically Todd's age, was diagnosed with colon cancer, and it went the other direction where within a few weeks he was gone. Yeah. Uh, and so for me, like, it's one of these things that I'm starting to think about, you know, I, I'm not planning on this, but it's like I could be three quarters through my life right now. Right. And it really brings a sense of urgency, and, like, I hear about – uh, Steve Jobs is a great example of someone that he realized how limited his time was and he knew like every day he had to just knock things out of the ballpark and it made it it made his work, uh, which is I don't think so much building computers, but accomplishing something that much more urgent and important. And like when I have students that that don't have that sense of urgency, it drives me crazy because it's like you need to accomplish something here like your time could be over tomorrow. You never know. So, yeah, yeah, it was, like I said, I mean, I was very happy to hear that everything was, you know, almost weirdly okay for Todd. But it right. really does bring a sense of urgency to the things that we do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Ben, I think I think you're totally right. And, I'm, you know, I'm sorry to hear that, um, your, you know, your own experience with that. But I, you're, I, I think that, too, has kind of changed also my outlook on, you know, just the stuff that I'm doing, whether it's trying to balance, um, you know, like the very, very important, like crucial family stuff that's, that's happening during this phase of my life 
with the professional stuff or just what I choose to do professionally. Like I, you know, I don't want to, you know, you just have, you have to put your, your, your energy and your time really intentionally into, into areas that you think will make a big difference. And yeah, well, I think the key word there is intentionally. Right. Right. Hmm. And that, and that's, I think that's hard. Like that was not me in my twenties or even from most of my thirties, to be honest, it was like, put my attention into everything because man, I just got to like, I just got to devour every, you know, like there was, there was no level of discernment about like, should I do this? Should I do this? Should I, you know? Um, and, and so, uh, you know, I, th- I think a lot of us end up kind of spreading, ourselves a bit too thin. And I know there's different kind of philosophical approaches with that. Like you could say, well, yeah, but you need all the experience. And, you know, I'm certainly happy, um, <clears throat> for my, for my earlier career and, and getting, you know, certain experiences, but, but at the same time you do have to like maybe put the brakes on and say like, okay, but going forward, like, what if I only do have, you know, 10, 20, 30 good years left in me? Like, let's, let's just really, really think about this and evaluate, where all of this needs to go. Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for, yeah, sharing in the good question. Yeah. So, well, let's, let's give Todd a little break from talk talking. I have a, what's the sound for you guys this week. And you guys have to be brave about this one because the hint is ear training. And the question I have to ask you and you all have to answer and just know that you can't be embarrassed because yeah. Anyway, that's all I can say right now, but the, the, the hint is ear <laughs> and you must respond with the interval went up or down. Okay. Yes, I know it's very basic, but <laughs> okay, here we go. Down. down. Anybody hear anything other than down? No. Ben? Down. Down. Uh Uh-oh. Okay, maybe this isn't going to work. Let's try another one. (laughs) I heard uh, up. I think I know where you're going with this, though. I've heard about this. (laughs) Okay, so so Todd heard up. I heard down on that one. I heard down. You also heard down. Okay, let's let's keep going here. (laughs) What do you got? Up. Up. Oh man, I heard a clear down. Okay, wow. <laughs> this is okay. We're we're actually both right. Proving the point. Okay. Up. up, up, up. Oh my god, <laughs> I keep hearing down. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> okay, so what's going on there? Well, first of all, we're we're all correct. It's both going up and down, and what you're hearing is something fit, right? called Diana Deutsch's <laughs> tritone paradox. I'm oh, kidding, kidding. Oh, sorry, Ben, are you saying stuff? I said it's a perfect fifth, right? <laughs> <laughs> it is not a perfect fifth. <laughs> so, yeah, this is something called the tritone paradox, and it's an interesting phenomenon discovered by British psychologist Diana Deutsch. Diana Deutsch is professor of psychology at the University of California, San Diego. She is internationally known for the musical illusions and paradoxes that she discovered. These include the octave illusion, the scale illusion, the glissando illusion, the tritone paradox, the cambiata illusion, I'm not sure what that one is, phantom words illusion, and the speech to song illusion, among some others. She also explores memory of music and how we relate the sounds of music and speech to each other. In addition, she studies absolute pitch and why some people possess it and why it is so rare. So that thing we just we just did, I just put you guys through, is a computer-generated sine wave of a pitch going outward to a tritone and an octave, so say F sharp, going outward to, to C's in both directions. Hmm. So that time when I played it on the piano, I the lower note came out to me, but both notes are there. And there's something about the purity of the sine wave that makes it blend more. I've noticed it only <laughs> works really well with the sine wave. So, you're not really able to tell which one and your mind will pull you one way or the other. And, and for me, I've noticed it really matters what range it's in and the change of timbre. Like when I'm goofing around with this, 
I'll notice, oh yeah, I hear it very clearly there when it's a smooth, like say woodwind sound, but here on the piano, it's uh, less clear. So yeah, that's the tritone paradox. And what's neat is she's discovered that whether you choose up or down is the same thing that your mother will do also, because a lot of what she does has to do with language and also where we're from. So depending on what language you speak, you she's found these consistent patterns within what people hear and perceive in the tritone paradox. Hmm. Yes, yeah, so this is about the fourth time we've said this wor word, music psychology, and about the fourth time it's come up. She has a book called The Psychology of Music, and I wanted to walk you guys through one more fun one, and there's a bunch. You just look her up. Diana Deutsch, she's living today. She has lectures online. She get, she has this nice long one where she walks through all of these. And my favorite example, there's a link to it on her website, but if you just YouTube fifth graders and the scale illusion, you'll find a cool example of some an, an elementary classroom experiencing her scale illusion. And it's a, it's a cute little video where you got two kids playing ORF instruments, little ORF alto xylophones, and they're each playing a melody and it's something that happens in music all the time. You got, you know, two instrumentalists playing a melody, the melodies go together and you have a new melody, right? You got a new composite melody. So the original experiment she has is, uh, and a lot of hers work this way, is right and left stereo uh, function inside of it. So in the one ear, let's say it's the right, I forget which one it is exactly, but it doesn't matter. They're playing this uh, D minor seven chord in this pattern. Okay, very simple, right on that chord. And then a step down on the C major 7 chord, you've got in the other channel, or in the case of the video, the other student playing this melody. Okay, so they're very different little melodies, and then of course your brain puts them together and you have... put together your brain can't distinguish right from left and it feels like they're centered so okay. she has two cds believe it or not and i actually bought these they literally came in yesterday and the day before so i thought it was really really cool that her research landed her with these uh these cds that i guess she mass produces and sells and they just have her experiments on them and nice thorough explanations in the booklets as well as her explaining them herself. So here's just a quick snippet of her speaking about the tritone paradox and explaining it. The next few tracks demonstrate the tritone paradox and contain enough patterns so that you can carry out a complete experiment on this very strange effect. The basic pattern that produces the triton paradox consists of two computer-produced tones that are related by a half octave. When one tone of a pair is played, followed by the second, some people hear an ascending pattern. But other people, when listening to the identical pair of tones, hear a descending pattern instead. The triton paradox has another curious feature. In general, when a melody is played in one key and it's then transposed to a different key, the perceived relations between the tones are unchanged. The notion that a melody might change shape when it's transposed from one key to another is as paradoxical as the notion that a circle might turn into a square when it's shifted to a different position in space. Anyway, there's some more there, but I think it's just really cool because she goes through these experiments down her CD and they're really well produced and they sound great. And it's, it's a lot of musical concepts that we're familiar with, like the scale illusion. I mean, we're very familiar with the idea of, okay, you got first violins doing one thing, second violins doing another. They're independent, but they're played together. And yeah, you perceive it as one. So it's uh, sort, of, sort of like my point with the Alvin Lucier topic from a few weeks ago with I'm sitting in a room. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We know that to be true about sound but going through it you just you gain such an appreciation for the concept and it just really adds depth to it so that's your weeks what's the sound this, this just screams like something mark applebaum would write a composition based off of <laughs> oh yeah sure mm -hmm. yeah yeah 
Well, it, it, it actually, it, it, a lot of her stuff reminds me of the Steve Reich, like, uh, uh, come out, you know, the, yeah, these, yeah. She, these speech illusion things where she'll have people repeating one sentence over and over and over. And if you like come out to me, man, when I just sit, sit there and listen to that, I mean, you start to hear stuff that isn't or there, even, you know, uh, the, cum- the additive cumulation of hearing that for 15 minutes straight without break yeah, I mean, you start to make stuff up in your head, and then the next well, day... Well, even in, uh, in drumming, Steve Reich has what I think he calls them resultant melodies. Oh, and is that right? Sort of, yeah, and it's like, so I think I, Todd would probably know this better than me, but I think it's like the the singers kind of pick out a melody based on, like, it's like the same thing, like the singers hear a melody within the, like, marimba pattern, and they sing it, and it's like that. It's weird because you kind of hear that melody yourself and then all of a sudden like the singer is actually singing that results in melody that doesn't really exist. It's like the same concept. And yeah, like I said, sure. Todd could probably clarify that more. Yeah, no, that that's exactly right. It, yeah. It, it happens actually in, in all four parts of drumming, even in, in part one, the bongo, yeah. um, uh, part and you know that's these resulting patterns that we you know when you see part one you you sort of get this this um uh sense that somebody is sort of soloing over the top of the results and patterns but um but yeah and and in fact exactly what ben said is happening that they're we're pulling out specific melodies um and you're you know you're basically you're choosing pitch and you're choosing rhythm and you're choosing which you know which pitches and in what rhythm to actuate um and there's tons of them embedded in there and you know the the um, you can look at it and try to, um, you know, concoct, you know, things that you think are interesting, or you can just sit back and try to listen and say like, oh, okay, cool. This is the thing that's emerging for me right now. You know, yeah. like, dum, 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 or whatever the case may be, um, and allowing your ear to go there. Yeah. I think it's, it's fascinating. We might be the smartest pod, percussion podcast on, online. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Without question. Yeah. Without question. Yeah, I'm going to go with that. I like it. <laughs> well, and her accent makes her sound very smart. So much Indeed. smarter than the rest of us. <laughs> that's why. That's why I had the borrower. Laura, you got a <laughs> Facebook question for us? Yes. This comes from Scott Charvet. Or um, sorry if I said your name wrong. It says, "Hey Todd, love your videos and commentary on percussion culture." Um, have you ever received any negative backlash from colleagues or about the content of your videos, or is there a he's certain right. commentary <laughs> that you stay away from? And he also says that he's in Austin and would love to meet you someday. You know, really, for the most part, no, I haven't received any um, negative uh backlash to, to anything, at least that I've seen. Now that doesn't mean that it's, <laughs> that it's not there. I've only once, like I have a, I have a former student who like after one, uh, so one of the videos is about, um, like concert attire. Um, and <laughs> after I put that out, one of my former students who is in Michigan, he screenshot, um, like a conversation of like one of his fame Facebook friends, I think the guy even shared it, but then like just totally ripped, you know, everything that I said and like, you know, even like made fun of my speaking voice and everything. And, you know, and this was very early on. So it was, but like kind of a a trolling type moment. Um, But like, and, and, and so I thought like, oh no, you know, I'm doing like, I'm pretty, like, I want to do more of these and I want, you know, I I want to um, kind of, you know, play around with the line here and there, but you know, if this is going to happen, like I, you know, I don't want to, my aim is not to piss people off or to, you know, to do anything like that. So I, it did give me like a little bit of hesitation going forward. Um, but since then, like literally nothing, or at least nothing that I've, that I've seen. Um, I think everybody has been, you know, either very supportive or pretty supportive or, or, you know, as is the case with all of this stuff, if they're not into it, I think nowadays, like most people will just like, you know, they're just not into it and they're, they're, they're going to do other stuff, you know, or just not, you know, not, not take part in it, which is great. You have a choice, you know, like if this, if you respond to this type of humor and this type of pacing and, and topic and everything, 
cool. And if not, um, then you can, you know, you can watch Casey's videos or, 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 or whatever else. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, yeah, it's been, it's been good. And are there topics that I stay away from? I do have to be careful. Like, um, you know, I was actually worried when I did the marimba gestures video that I would, um, make, um, like, you know, purebred marimbists mad. Um, and I remember feeling a sense of relief at like after, I don't know if it was a couple of weeks or a couple of months after I put that one out and I saw, um, Nancy Zeltzman at PASIC and, um, I, and not, I mean, there was nothing specific in that video that was like making fun of Nancy or anything, but it was just generally right. making fun of the marimba. Um, but like, I was so relieved she came up and she was like, Oh, I love that video. And I thought, you know, I, I even told her that I was like, Oh, thank you. That makes me feel so good. Like I'm, you know, I don't, I don't dislike the marimba or mar marimbas. I actually, you know, I, I love the instrument and I just think it's funny what we all do. So, um, I don't know. I mean, I'm not, I, I, the only person I, I comically target is Josh Quillen, but you know, we have a, we have an agreement. So, mm -hmm. um, I don't, there's no crossing of the line with that. So yeah. Sounds like the same kind of agreement Casey has with Pius. Right. Right. I think theirs is funnier yeah. though. Like both Todd and Josh are funny. Whereas <laughs> Pius is he's just not funny. He needs to work on it a little bit. <laughs> I liked the marimba gestures video. Yeah. I liked it a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that was maybe the first one to people say, think... Hey, you got to watch this. Do you know this? Yeah. Do you know this liquid drum guy, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's the first one I remember. Yeah. Yeah. That's still to this day. That still, I think is the, just in terms of like the analytics and views that, that one has been the most popular. So the trolls we've had on this podcast, there's only been a, maybe two, and they're still there. They're in the YouTube comments is where I find them because that's the station I'm in, uh, right. which is part of Laurel and I's agreement. But I'm, I'm amazed. They're for our guests. They're for right. the, uh, they're against the guests. There's, there's some guests we have that they don't like and they have some personal thing with, but I, I'm amazed at the, and this goes back to what I was talking about with the advertising versus branding thing. And like, where do you put advertising on Facebook, et cetera? I, you know, like nothing you or I put up is in anyone's face where they have to go for other things. Like I'm not posting this advertisements for this podcast in, you know, I don't know, places that are not meant for ads, you know, it's, right, just, that, right. it's just that simple to me. So it's, it's so weird to, go complain about a free resource that no one's getting paid to do and right. people are volunteering to offer you and then complain that how you didn't like it being done right. Right. You know, cause you didn't like this person or you don't like this person's playing or why did you choose to have this guest on? Right. You know, I mean, man, if someone, it's like when someone gives you something that you don't want, you don't throw it back in their face and tell them everything that's wrong with it. You know, Right. like, dude, you can just take it and say nothing. <laughs> you know, yeah, that's, yeah. That's usually what we do with gifts that you don't want. You know, it's just right. that simple. Right, right. Um, it's interesting. And I, a lot of that's just got to be we're all learning the, you know, the, the online climate probably escalates quicker than we have time to keep up with it and process what to do with it is my, my guess. Right. Yeah, yeah, and I think, I mean, people will say all the time that, I mean, if if – if, if you're getting trolled and if, if that stuff is happening, I mean, it, it, it is in some ways a sign of success because you're, do, you know, you're doing things that, that are, um, they are resonating, you know, whether positively or negatively with people, you know, they're, they're like, they're capturing people's attention and it may not make sense to us to think like, why do you have to go out of your way to like, you know, be such a downer about all of this? Um, but, you know, obviously they're still listening, which, which is like the most ridiculous part, you know? Um, so I, you know, I think, I think it's good, but it it is always hard because I think for, I know the stuff that I put out there, like I feel the same way about it as I do any performance or recording that I put out, you know, it is like, it's, it's a time intensive thing that is part of me and it's a creative process. And so if somebody's like, man, this this really sucks, you know, I would like, that would hurt me in the same way 
that if I played a concert for someone, they're like, man, you are terrible. You're really bad. <laughs> you know, it, it kind of cuts in the same way. Man, Todd Meehan, thanks so much for joining us. This has been really fun. Thank you guys. Yeah. Um, I, I, I totally, totally, totally appreciate it. I really do mean that. And, um, you know, just in terms of like continuing to, you know, cultivate whatever it is we're cultivating in terms of percussion community and culture. Um, like I just want to thank you guys for doing this podcast because it is super duper enriching. And I love that people are just, you know, putting all of this stuff out there. Um, like you said, Casey as a free resource for people to just tap into. So, um, kudos to you guys. And I really, really appreciate, um, being asked to be a part of it. Yeah, man. No, thank you very much. Yeah, and well, for the ben record, Laurel? we do. Oh yeah, I was going to say for the record, we do think you're funny. Oh okay. Well, I I appreciate that. I don't know if everybody would agree, but thank you. I don't know if this episode was very funny though. They're expecting that, and like you said, we better we better do it again. We're gonna sneak up. <laughs> yeah. <and just> talk. <laughs> can you make a fart sound real quick? Or oh, all right. <laughs> I can just I can just yeah I can make that happen. Hey, well, thanks so much everybody for listening. Laurel and Ben, good to see you guys as always. And yeah, okay everybody, we'll catch you on one twenty six. And happy holidays. Bye. Bye.